Welcome to the Concordia Publishing House podcast, where we consider everything in the light of Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm your host, Elizabeth Pittman. On today's episode, we're glad to welcome back Dr. Reed Lessing. We're going to take a deep dive with Dr. Lessing into the book of Isaiah, including several passages that will appear in our lectionary readings in the Lutheran Church here in the next several weeks. Before we get started with our conversation with Reed, I'd like to thank our friends at the LCMS Foundation for their support of the podcast. Imagine a future where your God-given gifts continue to benefit your family and faith after you've been called home to heaven. The LCMS Foundation can help you create your gift plan so that your assets, things like your retirement accounts, your home and land, will leave a lasting impact on the people you love and the ministries you care about the most. Visit lcmsfoundation.org to learn more about creating your gift plan. Now on to our conversation with Dr. Reed Lessing. Reed, welcome back to the podcast. How are you doing today? Good to be here, Elizabeth. Now, I, we were just talking before we started, and I was mentioning it being gloomy in St. Louis, and you shared you're expecting up to a foot of snow right now there in Minnesota? That's a winter wonderland. Wow. Well, here's to having lots of cocoa and tea and warmth in spite mm-hmm. of all of the snow, which I think you're probably more used to it than we are here. Um, you know, I would add one more thing to your list of survival um, tactics, the book of Isaiah. You know, that would be an excellent way to spend mm-hmm. some time if you're snowed in. There you go. And I, I'll, I'll take it one step further. The book of Isaiah plus two wonderful Concordia commentary volumes written by <laughs> yourself. <laughs> there you go. I like that kind of thinking. Yeah. <laughs> but so that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to dive into the book of Isaiah Um, And as we mentioned, Dr. Lessing has written two volumes of a Concordia commentary on Isaiah, so there's no one better to talk to about the book. So let's let's start with some general questions, and then we'll pivot into some specific conversation about some verses. First of all, who was Isaiah? So Isaiah is a Hebrew prophet who lived um, in the 8th century and 7th century BC. He's probably... Born in Jerusalem, we know that that's where he uh, lives um, through what he tells us in his uh, prophet or his prophetic book. And um, we don't know if he's born there, but that's where he lives. And he's married. He's married. He doesn't mention his wife's name. That's kind of an atrocity, isn't it? But he mentions at least (laughs) two of his children's names, uh, Mahar Shalal Hasbaz and Sha'er Yashub. Uh, which in good Lutheran fashion, uh, Mahar Shalal Haspaz is the law child, uh, speed the prey, hasten the spoil, which means that uh, the nation is going to be conquered. And then uh, Sher'ar Yeshuv would be the gospel child. A remnant will remain. Um, So Isaiah is uh, called about 740 BC, the year that King Uzziah died. He tells us that in 6.1. Uh, he lived a long life, long ministry. He probably dies uh, around 680 BC. Uh, and in all likelihood, at least according to tradition, uh, the most wicked of all Judean kings, Manasseh, had Isaiah sawn in two. So he uh, died a martyr's death. Well, but, and I will say in his the course of his writings, he did have a significant impact on the Bible. I was reading, I was looking at your commentary, just the sheer number of verses in the New Testament that quote Isaiah. Um, There's such a profound impact. And I know it's, it's off, the book is often referred to as the gospel of Isaiah. Is that correct? That's right. So just in terms of quotations, the book of Psalms gets pride of place when you look at the New Testament use of the Old Testament. But in, in terms of uh, sheer influence, it would be Isaiah. Isaiah is second in terms of allusions, quotes uh, from Old Testament to New Testament. Uh, but, but I would say, and this is pretty much a scholarly consensus, uh, that the books of Mark, Luke, Acts, Romans, 1 Peter, um, 
all use the book of Isaiah, especially chapters 40 to 55, as their template to tell the Jesus story. So this is just amazing. Even if we would uh, narrow it down to Luke and Acts, we have one fourth of the New Testament right there. So you throw in Mark and Romans and uh, First Peter, and uh, it's, it's quite a sizable influence he had uh, on the New Testament, especially the best 16 chapters of the book. Uh, chapters 40 to 55, <laughs> especially during Advent, right? Comfort, comfort ye my people. Um, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1. Really, Isaiah 41 through 11 is, is just saturated with the Advent and Christmas themes, right? Absolutely. It's, there's, there's so much, there's such rich language and meaning mm-hmm. throughout those chapters. And you're, th- there is a shift if, as you're looking at the book of Isaiah as a whole, there's, there's a bit of a change in focus from the first 39 chapters to then moving into 40 through 66. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, so 1 to 39 uh, is going to uh, encapsulate uh, not only Isaiah's prophecies during um, most of his ministry, but also his life. Um, in fact, in chapter 39, he appears... Uh, rebuking King Hezekiah for showing some Babylonian envoys, the treasuries of the kingdom, uh, which really sets up then the Babylonian captivity, which is what he will address prophetically uh, in chapters 40 to 55. So that section of the book has as its uh, twin themes, uh, Israel's departure from Babylon uh, and the substitute servant. Uh, And then when we switch to the last 11 chapters, uh, 56 to 66, uh, in all likelihood, uh, Isaiah then is giving the template for uh, the offspring of the servant, um, the suffering servant, the substitute servant, uh, which he, he speaks of for the first time, servants plural, first time in the book in chapter chapter 54 verse 17. So what happens to these offspring, that's the word Isaiah uses, uh, of the suffering servant, we would say the followers, the believers, what's going to happen to them? Uh, And that's the last 11 chapters, uh, which then um, is going to be used by Luke a lot in the book of Acts to uh, explain the Jesus movement. Talk about the servant of Yahweh. Who is that? (laughs) When we hear the phrase, the servant of Yahweh, who are we talking about? Right. So um, certainly there are other people uh, called uh, Eved Yahweh, servant of the Lord in the Old Testament. Specifically, Moses uh, is the servant of the Lord. Uh, David gets that title. Uh, But certainly when we get to Isaiah, that's um, a bit of a mystery. Uh, So as I was working on chapters 40 to 55, about 12 years ago, um, I found that there was a lot of uh, secondary literature to plow through a lot of different opinions on who this servant is. And and we're now being more specific, uh, chapters of 42, 49, 50, and then 52 and 53. Who is this servant? Um, So what I found, uh, to my great delight, um, is that these uh, four sections of Isaiah, they're often called servant songs, but it's not as though they're a different genre from the rest of this section of Isaiah. They're they're all poems, uh, but historically they're called the four servant songs. So we're kind of stuck with that nomenclature, Uh, but our listeners want to know that there's nothing that makes them song-like. They're they're simply uh, poetic. At any rate, uh, you could read the book of Isaiah in this section and and not see the story. So there's actually a story being told uh, through these four servant songs. So as we look at the first one, and for me, I might just back up. This was just um, you know, you talk to any commentary writer and, and <laughs> you do this in large part because you're fascinated with the Bible. All right. You're just you're gripped by the Bible. You, you realize that uh, as you research and study, 
uh, that there are going to be all kinds of wonderful uh, surprises, uh, and not only on an intellectual basis, obviously that's, that's uh, stimulating, but much more so spiritually. It's, it's uh, edifying uh, uh, for uh, all of us, right, to dig into God's word. So I can't tell you the, the, the insight and the joy I, I discovered uh, that other people had discovered too. I just was able to build on their insights. At any rate, in chapter 42, verse 1, behold my servant, all right? This servant then is going to be uh, Israel in Babylonian captivity, all right? Um, and this is the nation. Uh, and, and God is going to place his spirit on the nation. And the nation is going to bring, I'm looking specifically at chapter 42, verse 1, uh, justice, justice um, to the nations, right? So that little word justice uh, needs to be understood correctly in its context. It means the judgment, all right, in this context. It can mean justice. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it in other contexts, but here it means uh, the judgment. And what's the judgment? Well, it's actually uh, in the last uh, verse of chapter 41, 41. So the judgment is that all the gods of the nation, specifically the Babylonian gods, there are over 2,000 in the ancient Babylonian pantheon, the, the Babylonian gods are uh, nothing, uh, they are iniquity, uh, they're wind, uh, and they are... Uh, agents of chaos. The Hebrew there is tohu, uh, formless, uh, famously comes in Genesis 1 verse 2. So that's the judgment that the nation is to bring to the other nations of the world, uh, that all the gods of the nations are uh, nothing, um, wind, vapor, mist, etc. Uh, so that's their mission, all right? They being the, the exiles in Babylon. What happens then uh, throughout these chapters uh, leading up to chapter 48 um, is that the nation is unable to bring God's judgment against the idols of the world because they themselves are caught in idolatry. Uh, so you can't bring people out of darkness when you're in the darkness. <laughs> can't bring people out of falsehood when you're living the lie. Um, so chapter 48 then uh, is God's rebuke through Isaiah uh, to this exilic community uh, that you have forfeited now uh, this status of servant. That is to say, be the, the light to the Gentiles. Um, so chapter 49, servant Israel is dismissed. Chapter, I'm sorry, chapter 48, servant Israel is dismissed. Chapter 49, we get the new servants, all right? So just as Adam needed a second Adam, uh, so the servant Israel needs a second servant. Um, so in chapter 49, we learn about the servant's birth and, and his mission. Um, and his mission then uh, is not only uh, to restore um, uh, Israel, you can see that in verses 5 and 6, um, but also to be a light to the nations. So the second servant is going to do what the first servant couldn't do. That is to be God's missionary uh, movement. Now it's reduced to this one servant. Um, and he's also going to restore these uh, wayward Israelites. Uh, so how is that going to happen uh, in chapter 50? Then we move to the third servant song, uh, verse 4. Um, and then it goes from verse 4 through verse 9. Uh, we see where this servant is going to be um, abused and rejected. Uh, he's going to offer his uh, face to be spit upon, his beard to be pulled out. Uh, so this is now the second servant, the substitute servant. All of these S's uh, is going to be the suffering servant, right? Substitute, second, suffering. 
Then we... Uh, well, as, as, as comfortable as you are with alliteration, all of these S's should be a good thing. <laughs> well, good, 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 good. So then we're prepared, <laughs> right, uh, for the epicenter of the biblical revelation, right? The Four Servant Song. Um, which I remember, you know, growing up and going to college and seminary, we'd always say Isaiah 53, right? Uh, that's where it is. Um, and yet, and yet, and yet, it must be <laughs> shouted from the rooftops that it doesn't begin in chapter 53. It begins in 52, 13, uh, where it says, behold, my servant will prosper, all right? So it all comes to a head here. Um, this servant then is described um, using two verbs, high and lifted up. So I'm in Isaiah 52, verse 13. Um, so the substitute, second suffering servant, uh, is high and lifted up. And in the book of Isaiah, these verbs, high and lifted up, are used only three more times. Now, how do I know this? I just spent a lot of time in libraries, right? And, you know, uh, it's not like I read the book and figured this out. Um, at any rate, um, high and lifted up, these are very important verbs in Isaiah. Uh, it comes in 6.1. They come in 6.1. In the year the king was, I died, right? As I said, 740 BC. I saw the Lord high and lifted up, all right? Um, in chapter 33, verse 10, uh, the Lord is high and lifted up. Uh, in 57, 15, the Lord is high and lifted up. So you, you become very cognizant in Isaiah uh, that only Yahweh, L-O-R-D in all caps, he's the only one high and lifted up. But here, all right, in 52, 13, the servant is high and lifted up and greatly exalted. So what Isaiah is telling us is that the servant is on the same level as Yahweh. Now, <laughs> the New Testament essentially takes that claim. Jesus takes that claim. Uh, and that's where we get this high Christology, right? Being of one substance with the Father. Uh, it all derives primarily uh, from this four servant song. Uh, this is where Paul gets the idea in Philippians 2, 6 through 11 of Jesus, who being in the very form of God, right? Uh, did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, right? Taking the form of a servant. In, in all of uh, the Pauline corpus, it's the only place where Paul calls Jesus a uh, servant, doulos. Uh, so Paul is definitely uh, locked in to the four servant song. Uh, and then I think most of the people who are listening to this uh, know that uh, he starts out on the highest level, uh, very God of very God, begotten, not made, all right, um, in 52.13. And then in, in the next verse, uh, things go radically downhill. Um, and then we were familiar with the, the lamb led to the slaughter, the uh, punishment that brings us peace is upon him by his wounds were healed. So that's the story of the servants in Isaiah 40 to 55. Um, chapter 42, right? Israel, Israel's disqualified because they can't announce the, the judgment of God against idolatry because they themselves are enmeshed in that. So chapter 49, his, his birth, um, his mission, and then <clears throat> his suffering, um, uh, in chapters uh, 50 and then 52 and 53. Now, <clears throat> I would also uh, point out, as I said earlier, uh, when you get to chapter 54. So chapter 54 is a marvelous chapter, um, but it's overshadowed by chapter 53, right? You ever felt like that? Like, hey, you know, I really have something and it's really important, but the person sitting next to me has something even more important, right? Well, that's probably how chapter 54 feels. But at the end of 54, 54 is a commentary on, on the results of the suffering substitute second servant's ministry. But at the end of this uh, chapter then, 
Uh, this is, I'm just reading from the end of 5417. This is the inheritance of the servants. See, so this is the first time we have the plurality of servant. Um, and their righteousness is from me, declares Yahweh. I mean, uh, yeah, I don't know how, how much uh, better it gets that our righteous standing, right, is from Yahweh. Um, and now we are commissioned, and I mean all of us, as these servants. And then, as I said, uh, what's going to happen to this <clears throat> group of, of servants uh, who are offspring and vindicated by the suffering second substitute servant. Well, that's what uh, chapters 56 to 66 uh, will tell us. So there's a story going on. Uh, it's not a, just a bunch of um, dense, uh, beautiful, flowery poetry. There's a narrative uh, in these chapters of Isaiah. It's kind of hard to pick out. It just is. And I would never have picked it out without just digging around in libraries. Um, yeah, so there you go. Long answer, but important part of the whole Bible. There is so much there. All the, the prophecy that Isaiah entails and the poetry. And you're right, it, it does take some intentional time to sift through and mm -hmm. study to uncover the richness. And so your commentaries are a great help for that. Before we move into talking about some specific um, verses in Isaiah, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned like the, the joy that comes with writing the commentary. In, in your introduction to 40 to 55, mm -hmm. you mentioned there's two kinds of commentary readers, and that can pose a challenge for you as a commentary author. Right. So you have the readers that are mm -hmm. reading from start to finish and those mm -hmm. that are lasering in. Tell me how you handle that and how you how you account for that in your writing. Yeah, yeah. You, um, you repeat yourself a lot, right? You just have to um, because <laughs> yeah. of the fact that you're you're assuming that people are just going to pick up. Like I'm doing a sermon on the fourth servant song. Uh, I'm looking at uh, 52 verse 13. Ready, set, go. Um, so you repeat yourself a lot without sounding repetitious. <laughs> Right. right. You, you use an online thesaurus a lot. Um, what I have found, this is just anecdotal. I was speaking at a, a pastor's conference earlier this fall, and uh, the person who introduced me uh, says very kind. He said, I've never read a commentary uh, cover to cover. And, you know, everyone says, well, yeah, neither have I. <laughs> um, but he said he read my Jonah commentary cover to cover. Um, and that's a little bit easier because that's a story you can follow, right? I'm not sure too many people are going to read um, uh, the Isaiah 40, 55 cover to cover. Um, so, yeah, you, you uh, find ways to say the same thing in, in a new and, and fresh words. But it is nice, even, even as some, and I've said this before in the podcast, you know, not being um, trained in Hebrew and Greek and the biblical languages, it is wonderful to be able to pick up a commentary such mm -hmm. as yours and go to the reflection and go to the commentary and learn so much from that. And I, mm -hmm. and I, I will admit, I'm, I won't, I'm not a cover to cover, but I will jump in mm -hmm. to chapter sections oh, and go sure, into that and sure. move around. And it's, mm -hmm. it's wonderful. It's, it, it is, they're tremendous. It's a tremendous resource. So we're at the point in the church year where in this, this next series of the lectionary, we're going to be seeing Isaiah appearing in the old Testament readings a number of times. So I thought mm -hmm. we could, Take take three or four of those and just kind of talk about them a little bit. Mm -hmm. And let's start with Isaiah 63, 7 to 14, which, if I remember correctly, will come up on January 1st. Oh, that's um, right. Here in the uh -huh. church year. Right. So Isaiah <clears throat> chapter uh, 63. And I'm sorry you said this to me, but what are the verses we're looking at? Verse 7? Seven? 7 to 14, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. appear in the lectionary for the first Sunday after Christmas on January right, 1st. Right, right, right. Um, right. So w without going, obviously, verse by verse, word for word, um, we would want to... Uh, situate this uh, section of Isaiah 
uh, within the context of, of 56 to 66. Um, and I say that not just to sound like academic or that I've written a commentary on Isaiah 56 to 66, <laughs> but it certainly helps in the um, understanding of uh, chapter 63 um, and, and in its uh, proclamation. Um, so everything in Isaiah uh, 56 to 66 uh, centers on what as some people call the fifth servant song, all right? Uh, so there's this chiastic arrangement um, in these 11 chapters. And, and again, this, this isn't like a Reed Lessing uh, deal. This is a, a consensus in scholarship. It's a beautiful literary design, and it's a masterpiece. Uh, so a chiasm is you, you start out... For example, just using this section of the Bible, uh, chapter 56, which is, you know, the start of the new unit, uh, Isaiah is talking about God's mission, God's mission. Um, uh, for example, at the uh, end of verse 7 in Isaiah 56, uh, we have this uh, wonderful statement that Jesus uh quotes from, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. And then Isaiah is going to end in chapter 66 with this uh, wonderful all nations target, uh, beginning in verse um, 18 of chapter 66. Um, so that's what I mean by a chiasm. You, you have A and then uh, that would be in chapter 56. 66 would be a prime, all right? All of which is finally to say, as I said earlier, that it narrows down, right, the middle of this literary arrangement from A to B to C to D, and then going back up the staircase from, from uh, D to B to C to A, all right? Uh, right in the middle is uh, chapter 61, uh, 1 to 3, uh, which is then um, going to be the first sermon text Jesus ever publicly preaches from, right? In Nazareth, uh, beginning in Luke chapter 4, verse 16. Uh, and Jesus says, in, uh, as he quotes this in Luke and then from Isaiah 61, verse 2, that he is to, to declare the Shinnah Ritzon the Yahweh the year of the Lord's favor, which is a technical term for the Jubilee, right? Which is a Leviticus 25 idea, which means freedom, freedom. Um, so if I'm going at chapter 63, verse 7 and following, I want to situate it uh, within this announcement of Jubilee freedom uh, and the, the great exchange that uh, we have in verse 3 of chapter 61, uh, where uh, a, a garment of praise will be given for a spirit of despair. Um, you will uh, no longer be uh, clothed in ashes, but in um, you know, great, uh, costly, beautiful apparel. Um, then, right, you're, you're aware of that, and then you look at the first verse in the pericope, 63.7, and Isaiah says, I will recall, recall the uh, cause de Yahweh. Uh, so the mercies of the Lord, uh, kazid, as perhaps some of our listeners know, um, would be uh, the chief characteristic of God in the Old Testament. Uh, all of which is to say, if you look at Exodus chapter 34, verses uh, 6 and 7, uh, God reveals his name, the Lord, the Lord. Uh, and the only characteristic that is modified by an adjective is kazit, mercy. Right? He's abounding in mercy. Um, and that's same word then is repeated in Exodus 34, 7. So this is uh, uh, the gospel word of the Old Testament, all right? Well, where does the gospel come from in Isaiah's context? It comes from this central um, panel uh, of the architecture of this section of the book. Um, 
So this is the, the, the great celebration, right? Uh, it would be easy uh, to go right to Bethlehem and the shepherds and uh, Joseph and Mary, which is probably where uh, any uh, Christian sermon is going to end. Um, but it certainly would want to begin with its context uh, in uh, Isaiah uh, 56 to 66, which again, going back to the four servant songs, um, has as its foundation, right, the second suffering substitute servant, uh, who is the one who speaks in chapter 61. Um, so, so that would at least um, uh, give people um, a, um, a, a running start uh, with all of this. And uh, again, the, the section is just um, uh, filled with the uh, gospel and, and um, good news and, um, uh, and God uh, rescuing his people. And um, also, also, I might just add there, there is a, a wonderful uh, incarnational uh, idea here because it is uh, January 1st. Um, so in chapter 63, we, we certainly have uh, a, 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 a triune uh, section here. That is to say, um, in verse 10, uh, they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Uh, so Holy Spirit, that term only appears um, three times in the Old Testament. All right. Uh, here and then in Psalm 51, um, and um, two times in Psalm 51, and then here in uh, Isaiah 63, verse 2. So uh, we have the, uh, the Spirit there, um, and earlier uh, in verse 9, uh, this angel of his presence, uh, this is the angel of the Lord, the the form of Jesus in uh, the Old Testament is a man, not the flesh. Um, so we certainly have the presence of Jesus, this uh, so-called Moloch. Um, and, you know, God the Father is uh, the one who's speaking this through Isaiah. Um, and, and the last thing I, I would certainly want to highlight uh, is in verse 9. Verse 9. So there's kind of an incarnational idea, the messenger right, in verse 9. Um, but in verse um, 9 also, we have these uh, stunning uh, words, in their affliction, I was afflicted, all right? In their affliction, uh, I was afflicted. Um, and so this is God's solidarity with the pain of people, Um and uh, that can't be uh, overemphasized enough, especially an Old Testament text, that God actually suffers in some form uh, already in the Old Testament. Um, and we, we have that actually in Genesis 6, verse 6, uh, for the first time, where God says he experienced a heart-piercing sorrow. Uh, because he made humanity, and now he's going to wipe out most of them uh, with the flood. Um, and I might just add, looking at the time, um, for more details, <laughs> consult the commentary, right? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, let, let's move ahead to the epiphany of our Lord, January mm -hmm. 6th. And the reading from for the Old Testament comes from Isaiah 60, chapter verses 1 through 6. Mm -hmm. Familiar to many of our listeners, mm -hmm. arise, shine, for your light has come. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little mm -hmm. bit about the context here. Right. So um, this is, again, within this uh, chiastic arrangement uh, in these last 11 chapters of Isaiah. Um, and he's going to be... Um, highlighting the renewal of Jerusalem, right? Um, so the, the um, feminine uh, endings here uh, in the Hebrew would be uh, feminine singular endings. So in other words, it's kumi ori, kiva oreik, uh, and all of that is uh, a calling for a uh, a female 
to arise and shine, for the female's light has come. The glory of the Lord arises upon you, this singular female. Um, so in Hebrew, the genders of uh, nouns uh, are important, um, not so much in English, uh, but Hebrew uh, cities are in the feminine gender, all right? Uh, so who is this feminine person who is to rise and shine for your light has come? Uh, well, uh, this would be Jerusalem or Zion. Um, so it's the vindication, right, of uh, the city of Shalom. Uh, Yerushalayim, Yeru is a kind of uh, not overly used Hebrew word of city and sh right, salam, shalom, peace. Uh, so a, a major theme in the book of Isaiah is the vindication of the city of Jerusalem. Um, also Zion, right? Uh, so we want to get the feminine city um, uh, understanding going on here at the get-go in chapter 60. Uh, and, and so Jerusalem's vindication uh, is going to be um, for the sake of the nations. Uh, so this reading goes on, right? And you've got people from all around the known world at this point uh, coming to Zion, Jerusalem, which takes us back uh, to uh, a central idea in the book in chapter 2, 2 through 4, uh, talks about the elevation of Jerusalem and Zion, and all nations will stream to her, and they'll beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, neither will they learn war anymore. Uh, so the... Uh, pastor, the, the Bible teacher of chapter 60, would want to um, not only situate um, all of this within the fifth servant song in chapter 61, 1 to 3, uh, and earlier uh, text that we've talked about uh, concerning the servant, but reach all the way back to chapter 2, uh, 2 to 4, uh, where uh, the same message is given. Uh, only in uh, different uh, words and, and different um, uh, imagery. But it's all about shalom, all right? The shalom, and, and shalom is not the absence of warfare. Shalom is God's restoration of creation. And it's going to happen through Jerusalem, all right? Um, and who then is Jerusalem? Who's Zion? Um, well, within the, the section of Isaiah that we've already looked at, this would be the church, right? These are the, the offspring of the servant, uh, which God promises he will see um, in uh, chapter 53, uh, verses uh, 10 and 11. Uh, and as we've already talked about, the plurality of the servants at the end of 54. So Jerusalem, Zion, these people being vindicated, this is the church, all right? This is the church. Um, and the church then is to be the, the conduit and channel of God's healing shalom for uh, all creation, uh, which is exactly what uh, this section of Isaiah in chapter 60 is announcing. And just uh, just uh, uh, make sure we've got all of this. Uh, Shalom is one of the names of the coming Messiah, right? Uh, in chapter 9, verse 6, he's a Pele Yoetz El Gabor Avihad Sar Shalom, Prince of Peace, right? Um, and this peace, as I alluded to earlier, uh, comes through the suffering servant, right? The punishment that brought a shalom was upon him by his wounds were healed. See, so shalom is healing creation. Um, so any uh, one who wants to talk about chapter 60 uh, within the context of Isaiah uh, would begin in chapter 2. Uh, make sure you um, pick up the, the great messages of shalom in the book, right? Yeah. There, 
there, there's so much here, and there's so much in Isaiah, and so much in what you've said. One thing that did, has struck me, and I, I know you talk about it in one of your volumes of the commentary, and I'm, I'm losing the place as to where, but just as we listen to you talk, the importance of context matters so much in, right. in any any verse of the Bible that you're reading, mm-hmm. but it's so important to, wherever you're starting, the verse you're starting with, it's so important to pull back, to see the full context mm-hmm. of the full chapter, the full book of everything that's happening, mm-hmm. because it does layer on so much, it helps it, helps it the meaning of it and the significance of it become so much more clear than if we are just looking at a two-line verse. Right. It, and, and Isaiah, it's hard to figure out the context, right? Because it's just generally one poem after another with a lot of words that sometimes we're not really sure what they mean. Uh, you know, proper nouns, we don't know the places. Uh, so, yes, I, I think that... Um, uh, Isaiah would be one of the harder books in the Bible to interpret uh, simply because um, uh, you're right, you have to get the context, but where do you start in chapter 60? Do you go to 59? Or um, <laughs> Yeah, I, and again, uh, I, I, Isaiah scholars would say, oh, well, on this one, you got to start in chapter 2, 2 to 4. Yeah. Well, I would say between... You know, the notes in the Lutheran Study Bible and your two marvelous volumes on Isaiah, there's a lot there to dig in and study. Mm-hmm. Um, and I encourage our listeners, by all means, don't don't shy away. Even, you know, at first glance, it can be a complicated book. There's so much mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. But the, 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 the message that comes through in Isaiah is so meaningful and powerful that it's worth the time mm-hmm. to, to mm-hmm. peel away the layers and, and get into the word. Oh, it is. Well, it as, is. as we... And I was just going to say, no, as, see, as... The, um, the first time, see, we, we have the word gospel in a theological sense in the Bible, which is like, what? The first time gospel, the word gospel appears theologically, uh, see, is in uh, Isaiah uh, chapter 40, verse 9. Um which um, it says, you know, get you up on a high mountain, and then you have, I'm just looking at my Hebrew here, Mebesaretzion, O gospeler Zion. So Zion is to be the bearer of the gospel, the, the Jerusalem, right? The new Jerusalem, the church. Uh, and what is the gospel? Uh, well, that's what really the, the last 27 chapters of Isaiah um, fill in. But, but you're right, going back to your earlier statement, Elizabeth, um, what I find is I dig into a book that I don't know a lot about um, in the Bible. It's, it, there are just, there, there are helpful maps, there's helpful, you know, key words, uh, key verses. It, it really isn't as intimidating as, as sometimes it might feel, Uh but this is, I mean, and I mean this in all seriousness, this is why we have Concordia Publishing House, right? To, to help people connect dots and apply to their life and, and be agents, right? Conduits of the gospel, just as God calls uh, Zion um, in Isaiah 40, verse 9. Well, we're fortunate to work with wonderful scholars such as yourself to help bring these resources, to make them accessible, to our listeners and our readers mm-hmm. and anyone who wants to spend more time. And it, it's it's a good goal for all of us to start where we're at and spend a little mm-hmm. bit more time in the word each day mm-hmm. uh, because that will only reap dividends for us in our daily mm-hmm. life as, 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 we, as we cling to the hope that we have in Christ. The more we mm-hmm. hear his word, the more we can have it imprinted on our hearts to guide us. It's a wonderful thing. Mm-hmm. So thank you for your scholarship. Well, no, thank you. Love, I love to partner with CPH. I really do. Yep. So for our, for our listeners, we will link to Dr. Lessing's two-volume com- on Isaiah, the Concordia Commentary Series, in the show notes, as well as to where you can find Dr. Lessing at Concordia University of St. Paul. because you You have some great things happening there um, at CSP and in your department. So I encourage our listeners to check that out and see what they're doing there. Um, and spend some more time in Isaiah over these next few weeks. Yeah. Dr. Well, Lessing, thank you. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Listeners, we'll see you next time.
Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Concordia Publishing House podcast. I pray that this time was valuable to your walk with Christ. We'd love to connect with listeners on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Concordia Pub. Visit cph.org for more resources to grow deeper in the gospel.